If everything is made of atoms, why can't scientists agree on what they really look like? The phone in your hand, the clothes you wear, the air you breathe, all made of atoms. But as scientists learned more, their ideas about what atoms look like kept changing. Scientists are like detectives, looking closer and closer until they find the tiniest clues. And that's where we meet the atom, tiny, powerful, and the building block of everything. But how do we even begin to understand something so small, something we can't even see with our eyes? That's where models come in. Models help us imagine, explain, and explore the unseen like the atom. When we say model, it's a representation, an idea, a drawing, or a structure that help us understand things that are too big, too small, or too complex to observe directly. A model is not reality. Let's see how our picture of the atom evolved over time. Our story begins over 2,000 years ago with an ancient philosopher named Democritus. He proposed a bold idea. All matter is made up of small, indivisible particles called atomos, which means uncuttable. He imagined that different materials were made of atoms with different shapes and sizes. Sharp ones for solids, smooth ones for liquids. He had no experiments, no evidence, just imagination. But his idea planted the first seed of atomic theory. Not everyone agreed with Democritus. The famous philosopher Aristotle believed everything was made of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. His ideas were so popular and they delayed atomic science for 2,000 years. In the early 1800s, John Dalton brought the atomic idea back to life. He proposed that atoms were tiny, solid, indestructible spheres, kind of like billiard balls. But unlike Democritus, Dalton had experimental evidence. He even said that atoms of the same element are identical. And three compounds form when atoms combine in fixed whole number ratios. This became the foundation of modern chemistry. But soon, another scientist would discover that the atom wasn't as solid and simple as Dalton thought. Enter J.J. Thompson, the man who found something inside the atom. In 1897, J.J. Thompson discovered the atom's negative particles, the electrons. Imagine the electrons as raisins embedded in a positively charged pudding. This became known as the plum pudding model. Thomson used a cathode ray tube to make his discovery. He showed that atoms weren't solid and indivisible. They had smaller parts. It was the first clue that atoms were more complex than we thought. But then, another experiment would shake up everything we knew about the atom. Let's meet Ernest Rutherford and his famous gold foil experiment. He aimed positively charged particles at a thin gold foil. Most passed through, but some bounced back. That surprising result led him to discover the nucleus. In his nuclear model, Rutherford concluded that atoms are mostly empty space, with a tiny, dense, positively charged center, the nucleus. Electrons orbit this nucleus, but he couldn't explain how or why they stayed in motion. That mystery would be solved by a young physicist, Niels Bohr, and his planetary model of the atom. In 1913, Niels Bohr improved Rutherford's idea. He said electrons orbit the nucleus in fixed paths called energy levels just like planets orbiting the sun. This helped explain how atoms give off light. Bohr's model could explain atomic spectra, why atoms emit the specific colors of light. This model was revolutionary. But even Bohr's model had limits. Quantum mechanics showed electrons behave like waves, not just particles. A new atomic model was on the horizon, one that embraced probability instead of certainty. 
In 1926, Erwin Schrödinger developed a new model, the quantum mechanical model. Instead of fixed paths, electrons exist in a cloud or regions where they're most likely to be found. These regions are called orbitals. In here, electron location is based on probability, not exact position. Today, this cloud model is considered the most accurate representation of the atom. Now, you might wonder if this model exists. Why do we still use older models? Why do textbooks and other references still feature Rutherford's, Dalton's, and Bohr's? Here's why. Older models are simpler and easier to visualize. They help build a strong foundation before tackling complex theories. Rutherford's model, for example, is used to describe nuclear behavior and gives a good visual of how atoms are mostly empty space. Dalton's model helps us understand the concept of atoms in chemical reactions. The Bohr model is still used in basic chemistry to explain electron arrangements and energy levels. So even if these models aren't perfect, they're still powerful tools for learning. Atomic models will help us understand how atoms bond, how chemical reactions happen, and how elements are organized in the periodic table. Everything in chemistry starts with the atom. And understanding the atom begins with knowing its story. Let's recap the evolution of atomic models. Democritus imagined atoms. Dalton provided evidence. Thomson discovered electrons. Rutherford found the nucleus. Bohr explained energy levels. And Schrodinger introduced the electron cloud. Each model improved upon the last. From imagination to experiment, from simple to complex. Think of atomic models like maps. Early maps were rough sketches. Today's maps are GPS. Not wrong, just better. So remember, every big idea in science starts with a simple question. Stay curious and never stop learning. This was the first episode of Learning with G, a new series where science starts small but gets big. If you enjoyed this journey, subscribe, share, or just stick around. Thank you so much for watching.